He found me again. English is my third language, so keep that in mind when snickering at my less than perfect grammar. When I was 20 years old, it was really hard to find work in my hometown. I eventually managed to get a job through as an administrator. I don't know what this sort of place is called in English, but I'll describe it for you. People who commit very serious crimes, usually arson, murder, or similar, who are believed to suffer from mental issues or personality disorders, are placed there instead of in normal prisons. You know what kind of place that is I'm speaking of? Yeah, that's where I worked. Now, I'm a rather petite woman, just over 50 kg, and looking years younger than my actual age. Easy target, you might say. I rarely interacted with the interns, apart from being the one to let them in and out of the gate when they had reason to be outside the faculty. And they always were escorted by the guards. There was one man, a short and broad dude from the Philippines, who always looked at me with the creepiest smile you ever saw, eyeing my ID badge closely every time. I, of course, had no right to what these people had done to end up in this place, but my boss felt the need to tell me about this guy. Watch out for him, she said. He's a serial stalker and arsonist. Never let your guard down. People think he's stupid, but he's not. He's actually over average intelligence. The summer turned into fall, and in September that year, I left my job to go back to university. It wasn't until two years later in December, just before Christmas, that it happened. I was shopping for a bracelet for my sister when I heard a whisper right next to my ear. Hello, Josephine. I turn around and find myself eye to eye with the stalker and arsonist guy. I didn't buy the bracelet. I left in a hurry, certain that he had only been on one of his short visits outside and that the guards were close by watching. They do that to let the interns train for being let out again. They give them freedom under a watchful eye one hour per week or so to see how they handled it. I didn't see any guards that I recognized, but I was sure they were there. I went home. My sister and I have on flat each of the top floor of an apartment building. And when we are both home, we keep our doors open and kids and pets can roam freely between our homes. We were in my flat, decorating the Christmas tree, when I heard... When I heard the steps. Not the light steps of my niece. Not the fast steps of my fiancé. It was as the slow, heavy, determined steps of the arsonist. He had found me, and he was on his way up. I threw myself out the door, locking and shutting. My sister had no idea what was going on, but I told her to take the kids, go into the bathroom, lock the door, and call the cops. I stood by the front door, locked, listening to the steps. I could hear him roam around in my sister's apartment. He had found her Christmas cards and was reading the names of her children out loud. Then he started searching for something while whistling happily. My sister, always a rock, was keeping the kids calm in the bathroom while I was listening to him merrily explaining that he needed tools, tools that could break the lock open. Since I knew who he was, and the police knew who he was. They arrived very quickly, and soon, the, the situation was resolved. It turned out that, since there are too few places to keep those people, some had been let out early to make room for those considered more dangerous. I guess he found me by chance that day in the store, and decided there and then that he had to go after me. It was a frightening experience, and if my boss hadn't warned me so vigorously about this man... I would not have acted as fast as I did. An Addict on the Jeep Here in the Philippines, we ride the Jeep. It is one of the most common types of transportation in the country. Now, I've encountered a lot of weird people while riding the jeep, like a drunk guy with a bite mark on his face, an old scary woman, etc. But this guy, I, I just could not forget. Anyways, I'm a student, and I ride the jeep every day. From where I live, I would need to ride a total of two jeeps to arrive at my school. 
since I live so far from my school, and traffic is common here in the Philippines, especially in Manila. I would wake up very early every day. I would wake up exactly at 4.10 a.m. and prepare myself for school. I would leave my house at 5 a.m. or 5.10 a.m. and wake on a jeepney stop just right beside my house. On that exact time, only a few jeeps could be sighted since it's still early. Furthermore, once you ride a jeep there that early, there would only be a few passengers on it. And the most common passengers you encounter that early in the morning would be workers and students. Anyways, there's this creepy encounter when I commuted really early in the morning. It was still 5 a.m. on my wristwatch. There wasn't so much jeep because it was still early. This jeep, if I remembered correctly, had three to four passengers, one on the seat beside the driver and two or three on the back. As I entered the jeep, I immediately noticed the creepy guy. He was slim and looked like he was in his 30s. He had a backpack with him that he was holding in a way like how a child would hold a teddy bear. When riding the jeep, you have to hand out your payment to the driver. The passengers would reach for your money and pass it till it reaches the driver. Since the jeep I was riding wasn't full yet, I slid closer to the driver's seat and handed out my cash. I caught a glimpse on the weird creepy guy. He was smiling but wasn't looking at me. Throughout the ride, I quietly observed him just to know why he was smiling like that. His grin was so wide, it was... it was eerie. I got uncomfortable because I was riding a jeep with a strange, smiling man, and it was still dark because it was still 5am. I then told myself that it's okay since there are other passengers with me that looked harmless. But after that, it was me and the creepy man left on the passenger seat. The other passengers already arrived on their destination and exited the vehicle. The creepy man was still smiling, but at this time, it seemed like he was giggling at something. He was also twitchy. He couldn't contain himself on the seat. I got really scared because what if he's on drugs? What if he suddenly burst out of where he was sitting and attacked me? I got an easy. As the ride was nearing to my next stop, I felt relieved because I'm close. When you're on your destination, you say para or stop to the jeepney driver. This indicates that you're already on your destination, right before the jeep arrived to where I'm supposed to be. The creepy man said, para. As he was exiting the vehicle, he walked right past me and glimpsed at me. He then uttered these words to me. If you want, let's meet at H. Santos. H. Santos is a street name here in the Philippines. But as he uttered those words to me, the grin on his face was gone. I got creeped out because what he said to me indicated that he was a drug dealer. I still remember his face to this day. As you all know, our president declared war on drugs, meaning every drug user here in our country must be eliminated. The unsettling thing is, the creepy man I encountered was killed the following week after that encounter, after I saw a post of my friends on Facebook. The post said, They're here near our place. Be safe. Someone got shot last night, who was involved in drugs. Where was he assassinated? H. Santos. It was probably where their drug den was located. Flirting gone wrong. So, a little description about me before I proceed with the story. I am a gay man, although to most people, it is not really obvious. Because I have manly tastes, and I am considerably fearless most of the time, as I enjoy the thrill of getting creeped out. This happened in the Philippines in 2012. I was 18 years old at the time and I was living in a residential district by my university, where most of the structures are apartments and dormitories for rent. I was living in an apartment with my sister. 
Unlike my sister, I don't usually come home on the weekends because I would rather drink the weekend away with my friends. One night, while I was on my way to a party, a guy messaged me on Grinder. He had no profile picture, and seeing that he's less than a mile away, I figured that he may be going to the same university as me and is being discreet about it. I don't remember the entire conversation, but this is pretty much how it went. What's up, sexy? Head out to a party. You? Really? Same. Where? I was aware of stranger danger back then, but I felt invincible because of my height, but my lean, but athletic body, and as I've mentioned, I don't get scared easily. I said the name of the club. What a coincidence. I'll see you there. Sure. Mind sending me a pic? I'll find you. I didn't reply, and actually didn't care, because my plan was just to enjoy the night and see where it goes. So, I headed out around 10pm, still considered a safe hour in the city where I was staying, and walked a few blocks to the main streets, and then waited for my female friend, who lived in the district on the other side of the main streets, to pick me up. We both headed to the party, and met up with our other friends there. We took our seats and boots with couches, and ordered our drinks. Our orders came, and for a while, everything seemed normal. And I honestly had already forgot about the guy on Grinder. A waiter then headed to our direction, bringing a glass of martini, handing it to me. He said in our language, It's from that guy over there. I looked towards the direction he was pointing at, trying to adjust my vision to see through the laser lights and smoke. I saw this norded looking scruffy muscular guy in a hooded sweater who raised his glass as our eyes met, smiling before he took a sip. My friend started teasing me and kept telling me to go talk to him, but I didn't want to at first. After this, most of my friends were leaving their seats to dance. I couldn't do anything because I was thinking about the guy. It took me about 30 minutes to muster the courage to finally approach him. I could remember the next events that happened vividly. Not only because it was so, so awkward, but I have never felt so threatened in my life. I sat next to him at the bar, and it seemed like he had just paid for his drinks and was about to leave. Being a natural flirt, I knew I had to stop him and score one for the night, like get his number and get to know him more. Hey, I said, I realize that he may be a foreigner, which is typical, but there are a lot of foreigners living in the city. Thanks for the drink, I said out loud. Trying to cut through the loud music, he just nodded. Are you that guy from Grinder? I then whispered into his ear. He just smiled. It was weird because it almost felt like he was trying to be seductive, but at the same time, hard to get. And at the same time, it looked like he doesn't have a clue. At that point, I was already giving up trying to start a conversation. I don't know what the point of giving me a drink was if he didn't want to talk. Maybe he didn't like me, or when he saw me up close, I don't know. With that thought in my head, I decided that it was time for me to go. Well, I'll see you around, I said. But before I could turn around, he grabbed my shoulder gently. Come with me, he said. It sounded like an order, an aggressive one, if I might add. But at first, I thought it was because of his accents. Although I'm a big fan of Thor, and I don't have a problem being anywhere alone with this guy, it still made me nervous, because no stranger ever told me to come with them the way he just did. I'm sorry, I'm with my friends, I said, but we can hang out some other time. Let's go, he insisted. I wasn't freaking out at first, because we were in a public place, until he stood up from the stool. I may have flinched a little when he put his arm around me, because although I was taller, he looked like he could crush me. Sorry, I really can't, I said. If this was some other time, I would, but I can't leave my friends. I, I, I could kind of hear him grumbling under his breath, but as one of my friends approached us, he let go, and walked out of the bar. I felt relieved, but at the same time disappointed, because the guy was my type, until he started ordering me to go with him. My friends kept asking me about him, but I said he didn't seem interested, not wanting to ruin the night for them. I was a little worried, because I was thinking that he may have spiked the drink, but then I realized that if I was drugged, it would have taken its effect by now. We left the bar at around 2.30 a.m. Me and my friends have a high tolerance for alcohol, so driving home at night that time wasn't a problem. 
I hopped in my friend's car, and we parted ways with my other friends. Usually, the streets itself would still would still be busy at this hour, but since it's a weekend, it was empty, with only a few cars passing by. As we approached the bridge, my friend looked like she was on edge. You okay? I asked. That car has been following us, she said. I looked back and saw a black Toyota Vios. I told her not to worry about it, because this they just might have been taking the same route on their way home, you know? Well, whoever they are, I've been telling us from the club, my friend said. I looked back once again, trying to see how many people were there inside. That's when I saw the same guy from the club, and I was immediately worried for my friend. Still, thinking rationally, I told her he lived a few miles from me based on Grinder, so he might be on his way home and stuff like that. But when I told her about what happened at the club, she started panicking. I told my friend to stop by at the coffee shop on the way, and thank God this one was open for 24 hours. She didn't want to stop because she was really scared, and if we called the cops, they probably do nothing until something actually happened. And since we were both drunk at the time, it didn't seem like an option, really. We were about to park, but the car with a Nordic-looking grinder guard just sped by. We decided that I was safe after this, and that we had the wrong assumption. So we headed directly to her house on our way. The black Vios was nowhere in sight. I told her I would be fine walking on my own to my apartment. Although she insisted that she would wake up her brother to drop me to my apartment. I told her that it won't be necessary to bother her brother because I can protect myself. She knows me. So she just gave up and told me to be safe as I headed out. I've never felt threatened walking at this hour, because I usually come home from parties walking from the main street to my apartment, and since there was a police station a few blocks away, I didn't really mind. As I made it across the main street from the district where my friend lives, I saw the damn black Vias. It was a pretty common car around here, so I tried to calm myself down, telling myself that it wasn't him as I started speed walking. I heard the sound of the car doors closing, and although my mind kept telling me to look back, I couldn't do it. I continued speed walking, and that is when I heard a car start, start starting, which made me look back. It was the black Vios. As the car started to move, there were three things going on in my head at the moment. Run to the apartment, the closest option as of now, but then be efficient when putting the damn key in the keyhole to unlock the door and reveal where you live. Run to the coffee shop and hope there is a security guard there who could help you out or run to the police station, the farthest option, and have him arrested. My feet felt like jelly, and I didn't know what to do. The best option is the coffee shop, so I started running. I wanted to scream while I was running, but I felt like I was out of breath. The black Vios is now ahead of me and it parked a few yards in front of me. This made me stop, not turn around, but stop completely on my tracks, fight or flight. Then I chose fight. I had nothing on me that I could really use, and the last fist fight I had ever been one was in fifth grade, but hell, I felt like I was ready for this. The Nordic looking stranger stepped out of the car, and it looked like he was holding a small knife. I stood my ground, although I knew I was doomed, and probably will be murdered by Thor. As the Nordic looking guy approached, the security guard from our university called my name. I turned around and there was a screeching halt as he tried to stop his bicycle. He knew me because there was one time when I got to know him over coffee in an hour like this. He lives nearby, and I was reminded that he would usually stroll around this hour. Kuya, I said, feeling relieved. Kuya means older brother in our language, sort of an informal sir when you address someone older than you. Before I could even tell him what was happening, I heard the car speeding away. Kuya's security guard and I went to the coffee shop and I bought him coffee. He said that he was called on by his fellow guard, who can't leave his post to scan the area, because they apparently saw a strange guy lurking around the university. He even joked that maybe it was me, but I told him that I just got back from the club and I also told him about the stranger and what happened, and if he saw him when he called me. He said he didn't, but he knows the car speeding away. He also said, if I wanted to be escorted to my apartment next time, I could call him, so he gave me his number. I have never heard from the guy since then, and I was even planning to set him up using Grinder so we could get his identification, but I couldn't find his profile anymore when I created a new one. So, 
Nordic looking guy I met on Grinder who may have followed me to the club and potentially to my apartment. Let's not meet. And thanks for killing the natural flirt inside of me. It tickles. When I was about six or seven years old, I lived in the Philippines with my mom and two siblings. My dad was a Japanese, so he lived in Japan and was separated from us. My grandparents lived with us while my uncle, my mom's younger brother or aunt, and two cousins lived near us. I was a really happy-go-lucky girl. I wasn't shy, and I was friendly with everybody, even if I didn't know them. I had no problem speaking to older people. One time, our air conditioner broke, and we really needed it fixed, since it was in the middle of summer and it was super hot. Well, most of the time it's hot in the Philippines, but you get the points. My mom was looking for someone to fix it when my other aunt, my mom's older sister, who lived far away from us, recommended her boyfriend, who apparently was a technical technician. My mom was skeptical at first, since this person was a stranger and she'd never met him before. But my aunt persisted and finally mom agreed. He came and started fixing the air conditioner. The air conditioner was located in my mom's bedroom. She didn't trust the guy on his own in her room, so she ordered me and my younger brother by a year to watch some TV in her room and keep an eye on the man. Making kids keep an eye on an older man on their own seems stupid. What can, what can kids do? But it really wasn't that much of a big deal since there were people downstairs and was pretty sure he wouldn't be able to do much. And if, even if he did, there was nowhere to escape, since we lived in a middle class to upper class subdivision, and of course there were security guards, so there was really no worry. So, me and my brother watched some cartoons, and didn't pay much attention to the man, he just kept on working. After some time, he called us over and kindly smiled at us. We of course smiled back at him out of politeness, he didn't set off a weird vibe as far as I remember. He turned towards my brother and asked him to bring him something to drink since it was hot outside and he had been working for quite some time. I was slightly confused by this. Why would he particularly ask my brother specifically to do this? I don't know and the truth is I didn't care at the time. This is where it turns scary. I was about to walk back to my seat in front of the TV when he called and gestured for me to sit beside him. Being the naive girl I was, I did. I sat beside him not too close. I remember that his smile dropped a little before it came back brighter. He closed a short distance between us that our arms and legs were brushing each other. Red Bell still hasn't gone in my head. His voice turned into a whisper. Do you want me to tickle you? He asked. I thought that he was playing playing a trick, so I shook my head no with a grin. I was very ticklish, and I didn't like being tickled, because it made my stomach hurt and made me breathless. My grin dropped on what he did next. He lifted up my skirt slightly, while caressing my thigh. He then said in my ear, I can lick you down here. I was frightened now, even in a young age. I knew he wasn't supposed to be doing what he was doing. I shook my head no again, but this time no more playfulness. I was about to cry, but he held it with all my might. My heart was pounding and I couldn't utter a single word. He lifted up my skirt more. Come on, it's gonna be fun, I'll just tickle a little. He was smiling this creepy smile that I'll never forget. I shook my head again and tugged my skirt away from him, he wouldn't let go. That lasted for about a few minutes, with him caressing my thigh, closing in every time. We stayed like that when he suddenly dropped my skirt and he slowly inched away from me. Not a second later, my brother came in with his water, and he gladly took it with a bright smile on his face, as if nothing happened, as if he didn't do what he just did. My brother resumed watching TV, while I stood up and headed out the room and down the stairs. I didn't dare look at him again. I got downstairs and asked my grandfather where mom was. She said she was out with my aunt to the mall. I couldn't hold it in anymore. I lied down on the sofa and covered my face with a pillow and cried silently. I didn't tell anybody about that incident. Not a single person. I was traumatized. 
every time mom would hire someone to fix something, I would always sit on the stairs where the other person would come and I would peek to see if it was the man again. Fortunately, he never came again, but I never let my guard down ever again. I, I would always be on by, by my adult sign when a person I didn't know was near me. This continued on until I was 10 years old and we had to move and live with our dad in Japan. But my personality changed. I became an introvert and never spoke to anybody unless necessary. In school, I only had girlfriends and not one single guy friend. But even though I was quiet, I never let myself be a victim again.